for the introduction and the invitation and the chance to give another joint talk with uh, my two co-authors. Um, so Amundine introduced the infinitesimal model in its kind of classic form, uh, which is based on assuming additive effects of a set of unlinked loci. And what I want to emphasize is that actually the, the idea behind the infinitesimal applies more generally. Um, and, you know, as, as Amundine explained, it really is, uh, is relying on the fact that if very, very many loci affect a trait, then knowing the value of the trait tells you very little about the state of any one of those loci. Or to put it another way, the infinitesimal model applies whenever uh, the underlying alleles are evolving almost neutrally, when their evolution is dominated by processes of mutation, random drift, uh, and selection has a very small effect perturbing their distribution. Now, it's actually often misunderstood what, what's implied here. Firstly, the allele frequencies can change a lot. It's not that allele frequencies don't change, but they change primarily because of random drift. Um, this was first uh, explained actually by Alan Robertson in a really beautiful paper in, in the early 60s, which Amadeen referred to, in which he showed that the a limit to how far you can select a trait um, in this infinitesimal regime really can be derived by assuming that selection is making a small perturbation to the fixation probability. So in his regime, alleles were either fixed or lost. There was a big change of frequency, but the probability that they were lost or fixed was only perturbed a little bit by selection. And he showed that this, um, if you like, microscopic explanation was consistent with the macroscopic view um, which, which we're working with. Second point is that traits can be under very strong selection. As long as we're in this infinitesimal limit, as long as there are enough loci affecting the trait, you can choose um, arbitrary trait values and distort the distribution in the population to all kinds of peculiar shapes. Um, but the distribution of the offspring, the distribution within a family produced by two parents, is still a Gaussian with a variance which is independent of selection. And the most important point for the purpose of, of today's talk is that we don't have to assume additivity. It's actually, I think, a, an open question exactly what we do have to assume, and uh, I leave it to my cleverer colleagues to work this stay out. Open. It's going to stay open, okay. So there's plenty of work for you in the future if you're looking for a hard problem. Um, but it's clear we can, involve, we can have some degree of interaction amongst loci, and the thing still holds. It's about having uh, selection not cause a large effect per locus. Um, so, okay, we have this beautiful model, and the, the main attraction, I think, is that it shows that trait evolution depends on a very small number of parameters, and it's kind of miraculous, I think, that quantitative genetics um, reduces all of the complexities of uh, the, uh, the numbers of loci, the effects of alleles at each locus, the number of alleles at each locus, et cetera, et cetera, all those complications reduce to a very small number of parameters. Basically, the components of variance that can be explained by additive effects, by epistatic effects, by dominance effects. And so actually, even if we don't use the model directly, just knowing that everything should depend on just a few parameters helps us to interpret simulation results. We may be able to go further and get explicit mathematical results if we can assume that the distribution in the whole trait, in the whole population, is approximately Gaussian, in which case we just have to follow the mean and the variance. Uh, that's a much more drastic assumption. Um, I'll be concentrating on the full infinitesimal model and asking how far we can actually use that in practice. And I have to admit that the title was slightly ambitious, applying uh, the infinitesimal model. It's more, it should be something like um, working towards possible applications of the infinitesimal model. So I'll, I'll try and explain what I mean by that. So. Um, the first thing we, we did after uh, writing a paper on the sort of foundations of, of the infinitesimal um, a few years ago was uh, Alice and I wrote a paper on the establishment of a new population by polygenic adaptation, in other words, evolutionary rescue. And 
what we did was uh, follow the joint evolution of population size and uh, trait value. We supposed that there was an additive trait which determined the growth rate, so specifically the uh, number of offspring was e to the power beta z, so beta is a strength of selection, z is an additive trait that determines whether the growth rate will be positive or negative, whether the number of offspring will be uh, larger than one if z is positive, less than one if z is negative, etc. Um, and we looked at a situation where one or a few individuals arrive in a new environment, initially z is negative, so that the expected number of offspring is, is less than one, the, the population declines, and yet z is under selection, so it may evolve to a larger value, and if it can evolve to a positive growth rate, then the population can survive. So this shows one realization in which we start with a single individual uh, with an initial z value of minus two, so it's most likely to go extinct, but if by chance it can uh, get to a slightly more positive growth rate, and if selection can then take a hand and increase the growth rate, then we may get a sustained population increase. So these dots are the, uh, the numbers of individuals. Each dot there is an individual. We track in this model, a very simple model, which I'm describe, in which uh, firstly you have one individual, it has to self-fertilize, it's got no other choice, it produces some offspring. Those offspring can mate with each other at random. Their offspring have a distribution of values, which is a Gaussian. Um, so there's random variation being generated by recombination amongst the loci underlying this trait. Um, but all we have to follow, crucially, is the genetic component, the breeding value z, i. So we have a list of the genetic components, that's all we follow. We don't look into the, the detailed genetic basis. And we follow the pairwise relatedness. We have to follow the relatedness, relatedness between individual i and individual j. Once we have that, we can generate uh, generation after generation, and we can follow the model stochastically. And the key simplification is that the outcome depends only on two parameters. It only depends on the difference in mean value of z between the initial population, the initial population mean, and the threshold for growth. Here it's minus two. And it depends on the strength of selection beta. So we can reduce the problem to just two parameters. And those are kind of things you could imagine measuring. So we actually went further in this paper and got a bit carried away, I think, with various approximations. We looked at rather larger populations in which, uh, it, you know, if we have a reasonable number of individuals, not actually that many, we can assume the Gaussian distribution. We can write down a diffusion approximation for the change in population size and the mean of the population and get some results on um, probabilities of establishment coming out of that diffusion. So we can do all kinds of things with it, but I think the most important real value of the infinitesimal model here is that it reduces the number of parameters to something um, that is really quite manageable. So that's all very well, and we want to imagine you know, extending this and applying it to all sorts of other problems in the same sort of vein, the evolution of mating systems, evolution of selfing rates, range expansions, et cetera, et cetera. But to be sort of even vaguely um, realistic, we really have to include inbreeding depression and that means we have to include dominance. So we can't really, with a straight face, just rely on the additive model. And so that's the motivation behind um, extending the work to dominance. And in fact, when we started, I think I foolishly imagined that um, including dominance, that is the interaction between the two copies of an allele at the same locus within a diploid individual, that this would be easier than interactions between different genes, you know, different loci, epistasis. Actually, it turns out that epistasis was much more straightforward, and, uh, and we've, yeah, we will see perhaps why. So, inbreeding depression is the reduction in fitness uh, due to uh, inbreeding due to relatedness, and this uh, arises when recessive alleles tend to be deleterious, okay? So then uh, inbreeding generates an increase in homozygotes, homozygote recessives reduce fitness. But we have another phenomenon, uh, which is that the variance of the trait is attributed now not just to additive effects, but also to dominance effects. So we have an additive variance and a dominance variance. And this dominance variance is important because as the population uh, evolves, as it evolves under random drift primarily, the effects of individual alleles may initially be uh, 
very small, the marginal effect of alleles may be very small, but as allele frequencies change, they may uh, start to be large. If you imagine a recessive which starts out rare, it has little marginal effect because it never comes across the, the opposite allele. But as the frequency of that recessive increases, its marginal effect increases. And therefore, there's a sort of phrase which is a little bit misleading, but basically that dominance variants can get converted to additive variants through the process of random drift. So we actually are interested in both inbreeding depression and dominance variants. Actually, those are two distinct quantities, and either or both can be significant. There's a limit one can take in which if the effects of the alleles are, let's say, have a complete dominance, but the dominance is in a random direction, then they cancel out and there's no inbreeding depression. Inbreeding depression requires directional dominance, a tendency for recessive alleles to be deleterious. Um, so this may or may not be significant. The dominance variance may be small, may be large. That you can get a limit of these in which this is large, this is large, or both are large. Okay. So the idea is that the infinitesimal model still applies because we're still adding effects across loci. We have interactions within loci, but not between loci. We still have a multivariate normal distribution in the absence of selection. And therefore, what selection does is condition on the values of the parents, but it doesn't alter the distribution of the offspring. Therefore, the variance and the covariance amongst offspring stays independent of selection. That's the essence of the infinitesimal. So we still, you know, qualitatively, we know that everything will carry through. That's fine. The difficulty is that the change of variance components under inbreeding in the absence of selection is just more complicated. And this is classical quantitative genetics in which we find that the, in order to predict the variances between and within families, we require not just the additive uh, variance and the dominance variance and the inbreeding depression, but there are two or three other parameters which enter, um, which is a little bit surprising. With epistasis, we only have the variance components, but with inbreeding, with dominance, we have a finite but troublesomely large number of parameters of the order of six. And Alison will show you these in their full glory. The other problem, which is a more serious problem for actual practical application of this model, is that we have to track not just the probability of identity between two genes, but between two pairs of genes. If we have one individual which has a pair of genes affecting a trait, another individual, a pair of genes affects a trait, the variance in the population and the variance amongst offspring will depend on the probability that these four genes are or are not identical. So we have now identity coefficients amongst four genes, and there's a lot of them. So that's annoying. So, having outlined the magnificent and wonderful complexity of the problem, Alison will make it all clear, I hope. <laughs> it's become a sort of a tradition of our visits to Siom that we do a double act. It's also become a tradition that Nick keeps me guessing until the very last minute as to what he's going to say. Um, sometimes he misleads me, as he did yesterday morning, by sending an outline of the talk. <laughs> but it doesn't necessarily bear any resemblance to it. However, um, so after our last visit, um, we spoke about the rescue paper, and I was finally convinced, Nick had been saying for some time, that we ought to think about the infinitesimal with dominance, and the enthusiasm, I think, of John Wakeley, rather than Nick, convinced me that it wasn't simply Barton madness, and so we should have a go. So let me recap a little bit of what Amandine showed you, um, because I want to uh, indicate that there are synergies. So what she did was she wrote down the additive uh, version of the model, and we had that the trait value had a genetic component and a non-genetic component. And just as Amaldine largely ignored this non-genetic component, so am I going to. We need it there for mathematical reasons. We need it there to make everything go through, because we differentiate a lot of things which are not differentiable if you don't convolve them with something nice and smooth. Um, but let's wash over that. OK. So in the additive case, we had that the trait value of an offspring, if I ignore this um, environmental component, is the mean trait value of the parents, plus what I'm going to call a residual, which we saw was normally distributed um, with mean zero, and a variance determined by the variance in the base population that we'd assumed, and uh, the probability of identity of the two parents. So that's sitting over here somewhere. There it is. There we go. And if we're in a very large outcrossing population, um, we can assume that the probability of identity of individuals is zero and everything's very simple. Uh, the variance remains constant 
But in the cases that we're really interested in, our pedigree may become somewhat inbred, and then things start to get a little bit more complicated. Okay. Now, with luck, I've used the same notation as Amundine, because unlike Professor Barton, she sent me her notes neatly written on Thursday. Okay. So what the infinitesimal model is telling us is that if we know the pedigree relationships between all the individuals up to and including the current generation, which I'm denoting by T, and even if we know, uh, so if we know all those pedigree relationships, even if we condition actually on the trait values up until the parental generation, the distribution of the trait values in the current generation, conditional on that pedigree and conditional on these trait values, is a multivariate normal. And we cannot estimate, we cannot emphasize enough, this is a statement about distribution within families. It's not saying that the distribution across the whole population is normal. It might be that that's far from true. It's often convenient to assume that it's not too far from normal, but that's just uh, because those are the cases we can do analytic calculations for. And the pedigree can be really very, very general. This is coming back to some of the questions that were asked at the end of Amaldine's talk. So it can, it can capture things like population structure. We can generate it using selection of traits um, in previous generations. But what's crucial is that um, within families, we will nonetheless have this multivariate normal distribution. OK. Nick, your computer has stopped responding. There we go. And that's not what I wanted. Your, Nick, your computer is simply slow. Here we go. So why does it work? Well, let's think about why it works in the additive case. And it's been said, but here's a sort of explicit calculation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the simplest imaginable version of this model. So we're going to be haploid for a minute. And in Amaldine's notation, I can then write my trait value of the jth individual as um, the mean in the base population plus a sum of these additive effects. And I'm just thinking about someone in the base population for now. I'm trying to think about why, why is it that even if I um, condition on knowing this trait value, I want to understand why it is that's not really telling me anything about these additive effects. And this is something Amaldine said in words, but it actually lies at the heart of all of our mathematical calculations. So we're going to suppose that the scaled additive effects, e to l, are just iid um, mean zero Bernoulli random variables. Okay. And what I claim is that if the trait value is given by this expression, so this is just the position of a random walk started from z0 bar after m steps and scaled with this 1 over root m, I claim that if you tell me the trait value, I'm really not learning anything very much about the allylic state at any given locus. So put more mathematically, suppose that you tell me that the trait value is, is k over square root of m, what do I know about the first of those Bernoulli variables? Well, it's just Bayes' rule, right? So the probability that it takes the value 1, say, is just using Bayes' rule. It's the probability that the trait value um, is k over root m. I've multiplied by root m because I hate writing fractions in LaTeX. Um, so the probability that this sum is equal to k, given that the first one is 1, times the probability the first one is 1, divided by the probability the sum of the whole thing is 1. This is just Bayes' rule. And now we can simply calculate, because we've chosen things to be very simple. So that's the probability that the sum of this <clears throat> from 2 to m of the e to l's is k minus 1, because I've dictated the first one is 1. Everything apart from that is independent, uh, divided by uh, the probability that the whole thing is k. And just substituting, we obtain an expression like this. Now, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence by doing this calculation. I think it's actually quite a revealing one. So let's have a look at what it's actually telling us. So what it's saying is, that the probability that the first allele took the value 1, given that the trait value is k over root m, is 1 plus k over m times the probability it was 1 in the first place. So it's just been distorted by this factor k over m. Now, for a typical trait value, k, the number of times I see a plus, so, sorry, the surplus of pluses over, over minuses in my Bernoulli random variables is going to be on the order of the square root of m. So this quantity, this k over m, is going to be on the order of 1 over the square root of m. So for a tri typical trait value, I'm not expecting to distort things very much. But if I take an extreme value, I mean, if I take the most extreme value, k is plus 1 or k is minus 1, I'm actually getting complete information about the probability that e to 1 is 1. And you can see that the infinitesimal model for which the basic assumption is that we're not learning too much about the allylic state at a particular locus by observing the trait is certainly going to go wrong if I take traits that are too extreme. 
And that was coming in right here. That's where this delta T comes from. Okay. So what's happening is that for typical K, there are so many different ways in which a particular genetic component of the trait value can occur that just by observing the trait value, I'm not telling you anything about a particular allele. Okay, it's inescapable. I've, I've got to get onto dominance. So <clears throat> if we want to incorporate dominance, we're going to have to go to obviously alleles carry, uh, individuals carrying two copies of each allele. And we're going to write our genetic component of our trait value in a very, very, way very similar to what Amundine did. So there's some underlying mean. And here we've got the additive effects that we saw before. But now we've got a dominance component, which is depending upon the two alleles that an individual carries. Okay. And we're going to assume that in our answer, and this is again an assumption which makes them, it gives us a starting point. We're going to assume we have a base population in which the allelic states are just drawn independently from this law, nu L hat, which I think Anne Woodney didn't write down, but that was the um, distribution of the allelic states in our base population. So in our base population, for convenience, we're supposing that everything's in linkage equilibrium, um, everyone's unrelated, and we're just sampling their allelic state on each of their two chromosomes independently according to this distribution. And we're going to make some conventions. So remember that Amaldine already had that the expected um, additive effect at each locus was going to be zero. I'm also going to suppose that this expectation is zero, and we'll see in a moment why that's not resulting in a loss of generality. And in fact, if I fix the allylic state at one locus and average over the other locus, I also get something mean zero. So why can I do that? Um, well, I can do that because of what a statistician might call a Höfting decomposition, that if I take a general form of this dominance component, phi L, oh, and let me just make, make one more comment about the phi Ls. Remember, Nick said epistasis was easy. Epistasis is easy because we scale things differently. Um, the dominance effect is on the same order as these additive effects. Dominance matters here. OK, whoops. OK, so why can, why can I make this assumption? So I take a, a general dominance component, and I subtract from it the conditional expectation given the state at the, um, on the first chromosome and the conditional expectation given the state on the second chromosome, and then I add back in the mean. Okay, so observe that if I do that, this random variable is a function of chi L1. This random variable is a function of chi L2. I'm assuming that the phi L is symmetric, and so um, I can actually subsume these into the eaters, the things which are additive effects, because they're just functions of a single allelic state. This guy is just a constant. And so actually, I can, by rewriting phi L in this way, I can write phi L as this guy, plus a function which is subsumed into the additive bit, plus a constant. And actually, if I do so, then um, this weird condition is automatically satisfied. The expectation of phi L is going to be zero, because we're going to get plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one. And by absorbing the mean value into Z zero bar, we can recover this condition that Amaldine used. So I'm actually not going to give you enough details of the proof for you to really to see where this comes up, but it's an important trick that we also used in the epistatic case. Okay. Now, remember the key thing about Amaldine's um, calculation was that she was able to decompose Z into a part that was shared by everybody, namely the, where is it, is here somewhere, here we go, the, the mean of the parental traits and a residual. And we're going to do the same thing in the case of dominance. We're going to decompose trait values in, uh, in a family, so families being offspring of two chosen parents. We're going to decompose those trait values into two bits. One is shared, everybody in the family has the shared component, and then residuals, which are capturing the randomness due to Mendelian inheritance. So it's very much the same pattern as um, Amaldine's pattern, except that now the shared component is going to be considerably more complicated, and even conditional on knowing the trait values of the parents, it's going to be random. Okay. Uh, so in more traditional quantitative genetics language, um, 
you wouldn't split things this way. You would split them into AI plus RI, that's the additive component, and DI plus SI would be what's called the dominance deviation. Um, but we find it more convenient to, and informative to divide into the shared value and the residuals. Okay. So just as Amaldine had to introduce the notion of inheritance um, so that we could propagate our trait values from one generation to the next, so here we're going to um, use Bernoulli random variables to describe the, the uh, Mendelian inheritance. So in fact, she's introduced all this formula, which is very helpful. So XLI and YLI are going to be independent Bernoulli half random variables. I'm thinking of my chromosomes, even though we're not really distinguishing in this way, it's convenient to think of them as being labeled one and two in each individual according to whether they were inherited from parent one, I1, or parent two, I2. And I have a confession, I can't distinguish I's and J's in Amaldine's handwriting, or perhaps this would have said J1 and J2. Um, so <clears throat> XLI is one if the type uh, locker cell on chromosome one in individual I was inherited from chromosome one in I1, and similarly YLI is one if the type at locker cell on chromosome two was inherited from the first chromosome in I2. Okay. So once again, we're going to decompose the trait value into a, mean, a, a constant, this bit that's shared, and these residuals. Okay. And there we go. So first of all, the shared components. Well, this is exactly what Amundine did, right? So if we just look at the additive model, if we suppose the phi's are zero, you'll see that because we've now got two um, uh, chromosomes in each individual, this would have been the trait value in the first parent, and this would have corresponded to the trait value in the second parent, and this factor of two is taking the average. So that bit's exactly the bit that Amaldine had. But now we've got a lot of four-way pieces that we take into account. So what we've done is we've taken the, um, the mean of what's inherited. So in the same way as here, what are we doing? We're taking the mean of what's inherited from the parents. So we've taken the average of those Bernoulli random variables. Now we're going to have products of Bernoulli random variables because we're looking at inheritance on two, uh, two distinct chromosomes. And we're going to get four different terms, and these are the four terms that arise, and this quarter is coming out of our taking the average. So the half was the mean of x, a quarter is a mean of x times y. Okay. Now, even if we know the trait values in the parents, we do not know what this is, right? Because these are now occurring in different combinations. This was an allele in parent one, and this was an allele in parent two. They're completely different combinations, so it's mixing things up. Okay, I'm proving I can write down the residuals, and it was already typed for the paper, so it was easy to put it on the slide. Um, this is exactly what Amaldine had, except she wrote down a haploid, so this is the haploid version, if you like, right? So you've got xi minus a half and a half minus xi. But now we've got, so that was the first parent, and she said, oh, and I've got another term, which is lurking down here somewhere. Um, this is what's going on in the second parent. So this is the residual corresponding to the additive component, exactly what Amaldine had. But now we've got these rather annoyingly complicated terms corresponding to the dominance component. But you can see that what I did was I centered xi times yi on a quarter. Okay? And that's the last time I'll show you the exact formulae, I think. So. <coughs> There's something that your computer doesn't much like about this thing. There we are. So when's everything going to be well-defined? That's the first obvious question. By their construction, these residuals have got mean zero. And we certainly, we assumed that um, these additive parts would have mean zero. And so the expected value of the AI, that was the component that Amaldine had, is just going to be zero. The DIs, on the other hand, we're going to have to think a little bit harder. We did assume that if we took two independent copies um, of the alleles at locker cell, so one for chromosome one and one for chromosome two, that the expected dominance effect would be zero. We were able to assume that without loss of generality, but that was when we took independent copies. What if the parents are related? Well, if the parents are related, we have to worry about the fact that they may have actually inherited the same allelic type at those two loci. And we, and we define, therefore, something called the inbreeding depression, which Nick alluded to. 
And in our notation, what the inbreeding depression becomes is this expression. So it's just saying, what would happen if I were inbred at every single locus? Okay. And if I were inbred at every single locus, the dominance effect, the effect of dominance would be precisely this quantity. Now, up here, we're not expecting every locus to be inbred, but just some fraction of them. And the fraction that's inbred is going to be given by the probability of identity between the parents I1 and I2. Because by definition, that's the probability if I select a, a, um, a chromosome at random, a gene from uh, a chromosome picked at random from parent one, and a gene from a chromosome picked at random from parent two, those two are identical by descent. Okay. So the proportion of these loci where I'm identical by descent is given by this probability of identity. And so the expected component di, the expected value of di, is going to be this inbreeding depression times that proportion. And we need that to be finite, otherwise everything's going to go belly up. It's not well defined. Our organism is presumably dead. Right. And then it gets really messy. So this is where my resistance to thinking about the infinitesimal with dominance became downright stubbornness. If I want to calculate the variance of that term di, I need to know quantities like this. I need to be able to calculate the expected value of the square of this horrible mixture of the phi Ls. And this is where things are going to depend on four-way identities, because I'm going to need to know the relationship between every, uh, every pair of these, right? And the four-way identities that one has to track, well, there they all are. This is actually, um, this notation is uh, copied from um, the quantitative genetics literature, uh, and it seems to be almost nearly standard. Um, so I need to know things like what's the probability that in both my parents, so pa parent one is labeled one, parent two is labeled two, what's the probability the four alleles are all identical? So I'm identical by descent in parent one, I'm identical by descent in parent two, and moreover, I'm identical across the two. And then there are all these other possible combinations, three-way three -way identities, two-way identities where I'm identical across the parents, but not all four genes are identical. Okay? And these terms all come up. Okay. I don't know whether it's Nate's computer being slow or this being slow. <laughs> and then, having expressed all those identities, we go to find an expression for the variance which includes these quantities. You came up with six, yeah, you counted, with six quantities. So we've got the additive variance that Amaldine wrote down for us before. This dominance variance, which is non-trivial even when there's no inbreeding depression, that's what Nick was talking about, talking about at the end of um, his first part of this talk. And then all these weird bits and pieces, sigma ADI covariance of additive and dominance effects in inbred individuals. Um, so all of these things are going to enter into our expressions for the variance of that shared component in families. So it's all looking pretty hopeless and absolutely horrible. On the other hand, it can be done. I think it's taken a total of about four weeks stuck in the Vienna woods with <laughs> Nick bringing cups of coffee from time to time, but we've kind of got there. Um, and in fact, I'm not going to show you the expressions for the um, variance of A plus D on its own, or for R plus S on their own, so for the shared components on its own, or for the residuals on their own. But of course, actually, since the actual trait value can only depend on the two alleles carried by the individual at each locus, the variance of a particular trait value um, becomes considerably simpler. And it's only, it can only depend on pairwise identities, and in fact, it reduces to an expression like this. But you'll see that dominance variance is still entering in. This thing's still entering in, whatever this, this guy was. Um, the uh, covariance between additive and dominance, all these things feature. And I should say that because we assume the ancestral population is in e linkage equilibrium, um, we're missing a term. There will be another term in classical quantitative genetics. So I think one of the contributions of the extremely long paper in progress is it actually derives all these things from classical quantitative genetics in a way that explains what they are in terms of Mendelian inheritance, which I find a little more transparent than uh, trying to read it directly from the classical literature. Okay. So what happens when we um, condition on the trait values of the parents? 
Well, we have to make some assumptions, of course. We've, we're going to assume that these guys are uniformly bounded. In fact, we made that assumption in the additive case. It's not a particularly unreasonable assumption. Um, we had to assume, remember, even for the mean of the shared components be finite, that the inbreeding depression was finite. And under those assumptions, it's not too difficult to convince yourself that the trait value, at least in the base population, is going to be normally distributed. That's just a standard central limit theorem, exactly as we were citing over here. We then have to show ourselves that it, actually knowing trait values of parents tells us very little about the allelic states at any pair of loci. That's, again, very much like what we did in the additive case, so what Amundine's already told you about. And for the residual, for the bit which is encoding the randomness of the Mendelian inheritance, the independence of Mendelian inheritance at each of our unlinked loci guarantees that actually the residuals are normal, even after we've conditioned on trait values, and that's very much as we had in the additive case. Nothing very new is there. But for this component, for the shared component, we have to work much harder, because actually there is a weak dependence between every pair of loci. And for that, um, for those of you who care, we use a variant of what's called Stein's method of exchangeable pairs. To get bounds like this in the central limit theorem, which are really telling us, this is a very precise bound, and it's telling us how long the infinitesimal model will be valid for. I mean, it's showing that things are approximately normal isn't difficult, but showing that actually your model's going to hold over a number of generations is much harder. And this is also dependent on a version of the central limit theorem that is proved via Stein's method, <laughs> mercifully by experts on Stein's method, not by us. Um, but for, for these components, we have to, again, resort to that very large literature. Okay, but um, when we do that, we find out the conditions that we need, and they're very much the same as the conditions that Amaldeen wrote down. We need that the segregation variance that she wrote down for us is not too small. So there's enough variability within families. Our pedigree is not too inbred, if you like. We need that parental trait values are not too extreme. We already saw why that was. We need that the inbreeding depression is not too big. That's not just so that the mean is well-defined. It's also when we start looking at the errors that we're making in our normal approximation, um, this inbreeding depression plays a key role. So whereas in our previous calculations, this sigma t and this delta t were important, when dominance is there, this also is affecting how rapidly we get convergence to a, normally, to a Gaussian. Uh, distribution. So just to finish my bit, when we say that the infinitesimal with dominance holds, which we're now willing to say with 90% of the paper actually written, um, and we believe it 99.9%, .9%, what we mean is that the trait values across the pedigree are a multivariate normal. The distribution of trait values across the whole population may not be normal. So we're again emphasizing this point. Knowing the trait values of the parents is going to shift the mean of the offspring, of their offspring, in a predictable way. The variance is independent of the parental trait values, and it's determined by the pedigree and variance components in the ancestral population. And I think actually what happened was this skipped over two slides, and I'd even pretended to have a theorem on the previous slide. There you are, there was even a main result. So let, let's go back to it for a moment. So the trait value across the pedigree is well approximated by multivariate normal. It will be valid again from the order of the square root of m generations. The trait is decomposed into two parts, this bit shared by everyone, the residuals, which are capturing Mendelian inheritance, conditioning on parental trait values doesn't affect the variance of the trait values. It shifts the mean in the way that you'd expect from conditioning normally distributed random variables. OK. And back to Nick, I think. OK, so uh, unfortunately, there'll be a contrast between these two parts. Alison has made everything, I think, very, very clear from a mathematical point of view. I will now reduce the level of clarity, probably. Uh, but, so um, we have this, this wonderful model, which depends on still a relatively small number of parameters. OK, six, but six is not perhaps too many. It's certainly much better than having to specify all of the effects of all the thousands of genes and all the various alleles, et cetera, uh, that affect a trait. And so we'd like to apply it. We'd like to actually go back and do our paper on evolutionary rescue again. Um, or I'm not sure if we have the strength for this, but in principle, we'd like to do this and include dominance and include inbreeding depression and so on, which obviously are highly relevant there. The difficulty 
is, as I found as I came to think about preparing this talk, is that you know, we would like to simulate the exact infinitesimal dominance. And to do that, we would need to say in a particular generation, with a particular set of parents, we'd like to specify the distribution of the offspring. And to do that, we need to know these identities. And the problem is there are a lot of them. There are four-way identities now, not two-way. You might get encouraged. I was briefly encouraged a few minutes ago, thinking there was some hope. This happens occasionally. Um, that, that actually the variance of the trait value in an individual does only depend on the pairwise identity. This is a, a result that Alison showed. Um, the problem is that we need to uh, determine the covariance between individuals, because individuals in this uh, population are all related to each other. And therefore, this individual will have a value that's correlated with this individual. So to generate the set of offspring, uh, we need to know the covariances between individuals, and those do depend on these four-way identities. So actually, I did get as far as setting up all the machinery uh, for doing an exact simulation, and then realized how hopelessly impractical the whole enterprise was, and that we need to approximate. So start out. let's start out in this uh, this world where we, we still imagine we can calculate these identities. Um, we have to have a little bit of notation to do you know, a computational algorithm that specifies the probability of identity. We need a slightly better notation than the somewhat obscure and idiosyncratic quantitative genetics notation that we had before. Um, so I'm defining the probability f that a set of genes S1 are all identical with each other, traced back to a single ancestor in the ancestral population, that S2 are all identical with each other, but traced back to a different ancestor. So here we have sets S1, S2, S3, whatever, tracing back to one, two, three different ancestors in the base population. And the various sort of identities you saw before in the diagram are special cases of this. So it's actually pretty straightforward, if a bit fiddly, to write down a recursion that specifies, for example, given a pedigree, denoted by n, stored somewhere in the computer. Given that we're looking at generation 10, we have individuals labeled 1, 2, 3, 4. We have genes in those individuals labeled 1, copy 1, 1, copy 2, i1, i2. Um, so here are the two individuals in individual 1 and one of the genes in individual 2. Sorry, the two genes in individual 1 and a gene in individual 2. So here we have the probability that those three genes, two in one individual, one and another individual, those three genes are identical with each other. And that was labeled F112, I think, in the QG notation. And it's 0.038. So we can calculate all these things. And there are some necessary relations between the coefficients, which miraculously my algorithm actually reproduces. So if we ask what's the probability of identity between uh, gene number one in this individual and gene number one in the second individual, that's an identity relationship between genes in two different individuals. That has to be the sum of the probability that they're identical uh, with each other and with some other gene in individual one, plus the probability that these two are identical, but they are not identical with this one. They're distinct from that. So those add up, and they give the right answer, and so on. So it's all fine. And we can calculate all that. But if we have a population of size n individuals, 2n genes, n diploid individuals, 2n genes, we've got of order 2n to the power 4 coefficients. So the whole thing gets completely out of hand. And in practice, one can, well, on my small computer, I can do it up to a population of 30 for about 50 generations, and then it really collapses. So, so we have to do something better than this. Um, so what I'll do is not show you the simulation of the exact infinitesimal with dominance, because Although it's feasible for a small population, it's kind of pretty, pretty cumbersome, to say the least. What I'll do is show you some traditional classic simulations with discrete loci, a thousand discrete loci, and illustrate the results that we've seen before, and indicate how one might go about approximating the infinitesimal so as to produce a useful uh, simulation machinery that would only involve the pairwise coefficients primarily. OK, so just to uh, explain the simulation that I'm using to, to illustrate what's going on, we have uh, a single pedigree. I just generate one pedigree, um, assuming random mating amongst n equals 30 diploids for 50 generations. And the reason I'm sticking to a single pedigree, apart from laziness, is that we can run many, many replicates, dropping genes down through this pedigree, uh, 
Um, the genes will segregate in different ways down the same pedigree. And we can ask, what is the distribution of trait values and of the additive and dominance components of that trait value in a given individual amongst many replicates within a single pedigree. And that's important because the predictions are in terms of identity coefficients, which are expensive to calculate. I just calculate those coefficients once. Given those coefficients, I can predict the distribution across replicate uh, patterns of Mendelian inheritance, throwing genes down the top, you know, like a pinball machine through the pedigree, um, producing different realizations. So I generate now uh, many, many replicates on this single pedigree. Um, I define a single reference population, a base population, which is defined uh, as being a linkage equilibrium with a certain set of allele frequencies chosen from some distribution. I choose a single set of allele frequencies in that reference population. The distribution follows a kind of almost neutral distribution, 1 over PQ, a U-shaped distribution. Um, and I draw a thousand replicate populations, each of those with a different draw from that reference population. And that's important because each of those uh, replicates actually starts with a slightly different set of uh, genotypes and therefore slightly different initial additive dominance variances. Um, I haven't actually produce results on selection, but what I'm intending to do is to run selection within families so that I again can still use the same pedigree. So selection in general will distort the pedigree, but one can set it up so that what we do is take a particular pedigree, we take two parents who we know are going to be the parents, and we produce, let's say, 10 offspring, and then choose the largest of those. And so we keep the pedigree the same, but we're still selecting. We're selecting amongst the possible realizations of individuals that we could produce uh, amongst offspring of a particular set of parents. And this actually idea was modeled on an analysis of data with Frank Chan in Tübingen, where we were looking at a mouse selection experiment, where I think for entirely um, fortuitous reasons, uh, not to make the analysis easier, but fortunately they did choose to do this, they took um, pairs of mice, they decided on the pedigree ahead of time, and then chose the top male and the top female from a litter of 10. So that's the, the idea. Okay, so we have a simulation, and we can look at what happens in the neutral case here. Uh, we start with a population which has a certain uh, total variance. This is this red line. This is the genetic variance changing through time, decreasing through time as the population becomes more inbred. Remember, the population is 30 diploid individuals. We expect to lose variation over a order of 30 generations. The, the mean, which you can hardly see here, is averaged over a thousand replicate simulations. It's almost exactly zero. The, sorry, the mean of the additive component of the trait stays the same, as it should. But the mean of the dominance component, the expected value of these D, dominance deviations, decreases because there's inbreeding depression. And it decreases exactly as one expects. Um, if we look at the variance components, total variance declines. The total additive variance, the gray, declines. The dominance variance actually increases slightly and then declines. And there's also a slight covariance between the additive and dominance, which arises by chance. OK. So we have these you know, rather smooth patterns, but these are averages over many replicates. If you look at any particular population, even though we've got a 1,000 loci involved, there's still a lot of variability. All these things are all over the place. And this variability is actually primarily because of linkage disequilibrium. Most of the variation that you see, particularly in the variance components, is due to random LD, which will actually sort of tend to average out. So this is underlying this is an underlying genic variance, which is declining under the infinitesimal model solely because of inbreeding. Okay. So let's look at some of the predictions that, that were made earlier. Um, we can look at the, uh, the way in which the average values of the additive component and of the dominance deviations changes. And the prediction is that the additive, variant, the additive component should not change on average. The dominance component should change in proportion to the inbreeding depression times the identity between two genes within an individual. Um, this shows the average of the additive components over time. Generation 10, 20, uh, 40. Okay, where are we? Yeah. I think I've got an extra generation in there. No, 5, 10, 20, 40, yeah. The dominance deviation is predicted very well both within and between generations. So here is the prediction that uh, 
if we take any individual, the average value of the dominance component should simply depend on the identity coefficient of that individual. And that's true within a generation, you get this linear relationship, and also across generations. So everything is described very simply by this one identity coefficient. We also have predictions for the, uh, the way in which the additive variance, the dominance variance, and the covariance between A and D um, in any generation will depend on these identity coefficients. They depend only on the pairwise identities um, between individuals. So that fits rather well, again, looking through the generations, both within and between generations. We predict that the uh, variance and covariance amongst additive and dominance deviations, and therefore the sum, which is the total variance of trait value, that is predicted by the pairwise identity. And then we get to the more troublesome predictions in which we, we want to look at the distribution of residuals within families. And now we have all these three and four way coefficients coming in, but we still get a pretty good uh, fit for the, uh, where are we? Can't read it on there, it's too small. This is the additive variance of the residual values within families, in other words, the variance of the additive component within families, that's straightforward. This is the variance of the dominance deviations within families and the variance uh, sorry, covariance between those within families. And we predict those based on complicated and hopefully illegible uh, combinations of two, three, four way coefficients. The red is the prediction, the blue is the, the regression, those are very close to each other, so everything's working. Um, I shouldn't really be doing this because the mathematics tells us it's true, how could we doubt it? So I'm just sort of illustrating the, uh, the patterns you see. One point to note is that there is quite a bit of variation in level of inbreeding between individuals within a population. This is even in a single well-mixed random mating population. And it's this variation in identity that is annoying for us because you know, we're then having to track the identity coefficients, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the issue that we come to. If we're going to use this, this stuff, um, we really can't afford to calculate all of these multi-way identity coefficients. So we have to think, how can we approximate things? So, first of all, we can think about the pairwise coefficients. Even there we have a problem because we're having to track not just the trait values of individuals, the genetic component of the trait values, the breeding values, that's easy. We also have to track, even in the simple version of the classic additive infinitesimal, we have to track the pairwise identities. And that's fine with a population of 30, we've got a 30 by 30 matrix. Population of 1,000, we've got 1,000 by 1,000 identities. It's kind of starting to, to break down. But an important uh, point is that the distribution of identities actually becomes very similar as uh, we trace the ancestry back. One way to think about it is to see that you know, individuals have two parents, four grandparents, etc. We don't have to go very far back. In fact, I've order logged the base two of population size back until everyone has the same ancestry. And therefore, the component of ancestry due to more distant generations is going to be the same for everyone, essentially. And one can see that by looking at the distribution of pairwise identity, both within individuals and in genes in different individuals in generation 10, 30, 50. It's kind of fairly sharply clustered around a median value with a few outliers which are close relatives. So these are, you know, individuals that happen to be closely related. And so what we can do as a computational trick is what we did in the evolutionary rescue paper was to say once the population size gets big, we don't try and track everything. We just say, well, there's a background level of inbreeding which is the same for every pair, and we only track individually those individuals who are closely related. And that's quite easy to do computationally. And it basically means using a sparse array. So we only have to record of the order of, let's say, in a thousand by a thousand matrix, we record a few thousand entries, not a million entries. So with structured populations, we can do the same kind of thing. We might have a series of, of subpopulations, but we can still say, well, you know, within a class, we assume the same relationship plus a few close relatives. And between populations, we assume a different relationship. So again, we can reduce the number of identity coefficients we need to track. Um, interestingly, Himanish Sachdeva, uh, now in Vienna University, she used a similar idea um, not actually framed in terms of the infinitesimal model, actually taken from uh, an idea of John Kelly's a while ago, um, in which 
she just assumed that there was linkage equilibrium within, and therefore a Gaussian distribution within what one could call selfing age classes. You have a population with partial selfing, and therefore individuals can be from an outcross or from a parent who selfed one generation back or from a parent who uh, was outcrossed, sorry, two generations back, three generations back. You can imagine that with a high rate of selfing, there'll be lineages which have been selfing, 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 and traced back at some time in the past to different individuals, to an outcross event. With 90% selfing, of order 10 generations back, you will come to an outcrossing event. And so you can say that even though the population clearly has a very complicated structure, we can track and approximate by essentially a Gaussian approximation within each selfing age class. And that turns out to work quite well. So there's some hope that one can use this kind of idea of um, just assuming a simple, largely you know, uniform pattern of relationship, uh, even when you have some degree of population structure. OK, we still have these annoying four-way coefficients to deal with. And the hope here is that one might be able to approximate them in terms of the pairwise and just track pairwise. And so this is uh, just, you know, almost empirically in the simulations, plotting the value of the probability of four-way identity, 1, 1, 2, 2. That's the probability that two genes in this individual and two genes in this individual are all identical. That's, that's this coefficient. And that's the value on the vertical axis. Plot that against the pairwise identity between those two individuals. And there's a quite tight relationship. I actually originally hoped that it would you know, follow some very simple form like you know, f squared or f cubed, these gray lines, but it's somewhere in between. And then I realized that there's quite a complicated um, coalescent type calculation to do to work out the probability of four-way identity given that you know the two-way identity. Okay. Um, similarly for the other four-way coefficients, if we take a different four-way identity, this is F1122 tilde, you all remember the notation, I hope. Uh, this is the probability that the two genes within this individual are identical, the two genes within this individual are identical, but they're not identical to the same ancestor. So identity, identity to two different ancestors. That is something that will, will decrease with F12, because this is expressing the probability of identity between the two individuals, this on the vertical axis is expressing the probability of identity within, but not between, therefore decreasing relationship. As one might expect, it's a reasonably tight, not, not so good as here, but a reasonable relationship between the probability of identity within one and within two. This is the average identity within the two individuals. So if one thinks about how much variance in the four-way coefficients is captured by some simple pairwise measures, there's some hope that one might be able to use an approximation where we just track the pairwise. So I think I'll, how are we doing? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll maybe deal with this as well. So what I'm outlining there is the idea that we could do a simulation tracking the breeding values of the individuals, the additive and the dominance components perhaps separately, um, and tracking the pairwise relatedness, which is, is reasonably feasible for quite big populations, especially if we use some kind of sparse array approximation. We can track pairwise relationships, breeding values, and still incorporate dominance. We might want to go further and actually try and get some explicit approximation. And that's actually what we did in the evolutionary rescue paper with the additive case. And what we might try and do is just assume that actually the whole population follows a more or less Gaussian distribution. And to give some hope this might work, um, even in quite drastic cases, just go back to a paper where I actually used the infinitesimal model without quite realizing that I think a while ago in a model of sympatric speciation. And the model here is quite a simple one. You have a, on this axis, some additive trait, Z, which if it's positive, adapts an individual rather well to this habitat. So this curve is the probability of survival in habitat number two. This curve is the probability of survival in habitat number one. So there's a trade-off. This says that if you're in the middle, you're not doing very well in either habitat. If you have a negative value, you do well here. If you have a positive value, you do well here. Now, under an infinitesimal model, there's actually a very sharp threshold, a phase transition between if the variance, segregation variance is less than a threshold, there's a single unimodal distribution. You start out with a bimodal distribution and you collapse to this unimodal. If you have a variance, a segregation variance above some threshold, you have a bimodal uh, Gaussian plus Gaussian equilibrium. 
there's a small but quite narrow regime in between where it actually may go either to this equilibrium, unimodal or bimodal, depending how you start out. But pretty much you, you have this sort of sharp threshold behavior with a, a narrow region where you can actually be bistable. Now you say, well, how can we possibly approximate this by uh, you know, something like a simple Gaussian? Well, the, it, the black dots here show the, the mean and the variance of the exact calculation. The gray dots show an approximation which just says it's a single Gaussian, unimodal Gaussian. And as you'd expect, it sort of works very well, actually, up to a sharp threshold where it becomes bimodal and breaks down. So this says that actually we can use a Gaussian approximation up to, right up to the threshold where it breaks down. And you can predict the threshold, you can predict the critical value using this Gaussian approximation. And although I hadn't developed it, one might say, well, above the threshold, maybe a bimodal Gaussian, two Gaussians would work. So actually, I mean, in general, and I've looked at quite a lot of these models, a Gaussian approximation does pretty well, often surprisingly well. And my experience also, and let this be a warning to people, don't try and use third, fourth, fifth moments. It just isn't worth it. Don't go beyond a Gaussian. Gaussians work pretty well, and trying to go beyond that is a source of much pain in my, in my experience. OK, so to summarize, the infinitesimal model, although classically defined in terms of additivity, actually applies with epistasis, with dominance. Uh, it's an open question exactly how much, what kind of non-additivity we can put in, but with dominance, absolutely, it works. Um, and the crucial point is that selection doesn't distort the variance and the covariance of individuals within families. It can distort the whole population, it can have strong effects on the population, but it doesn't alter the variance within families. That is influenced in the infinitesimal, infinitesimal limit only by uh, random drift, i.e. by relatedness. Um, the full model with dominance depends on you know, six rather pesky terms, and I put here requires tracking the additive and dominance components. It doesn't strictly require that, but I find it more convenient. It's a point of some dispute, I think, with the other authors. But anyway, um, but it does require tra in, to do exactly tracking the up to four-way components. And I think the only hope for a future application um, really is that one can approximate these higher order coefficients in some simpler term, essentially in terms of pairwise relationships. Um, but in general, I mean, sort of standing back from all this, I think this whole enterprise is to try and say, well, maybe we can ignore all the genetic details. If we can actually get this to work, then we don't have to bother with knowing allele frequencies, effects of individual alleles, and so on. And there are an awful lot of people out there who are trying to find loci and find the effects of those loci. Their lives are made so much easier. Uh, in fact, they might even be unemployed if, if this method works. So here we are. Thank you. That, that require dominance, but often it's dominance for fitness that we are really interested mm. in. Mm. So what do you think about a more radical trick, which is, say, let's say traits are additive, but mm -hmm. focus on dominance on epistasis on fitness, and in this way we can yep. still use a simple result for the That's infinitesimal true. model, yes. and, and we deal with yeah. complexity when we deal with selection. That's fine, and I think actually in this model of sympatric speciation, that was the motivation that it is an additive trait. For the you know the trait is additive, but fitness is determined by its nonlinear function here. So that's exactly the idea, and it, indeed it's much easier if you can stick to additivity. Um, I'm not sure that one can capture the actual biology of inbreeding depression, though, by supposing that there's some sort of trait like numbers of bad alleles. Maybe one can, it would make life much easier. Um, but it is quite a restrictive assumption to assume that fitness is determined by some tractable function, nonlinear function, of an additive trait. Um, whether that captures dominance in, in particular, whether it captures inbreeding depression heterosis, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. It would be easier than what we're trying to do. So, you know, it would be nice if that were true. Someone at the back, yeah? 
Uh, thank you, and thank you, Alison. Um, so when we have those species with a lot of, in of inbreeding of selfing and very occasional outcrossing, like many weeds and stuff, yeah. where rescue yeah. would be yeah. interesting, uh, um, is there in the framework uh, that you developed together a way to know the level of, of outcrossing proportion where we can consider this an effectively haploid? Almost yeah. goose model, yeah. and, and, and where we, we shift and where we can not care about this or some trick using this strong inbreeding yeah. uh, so, production to simplify. So mathematically, it's sort of captured in this function, which gives you a bound based on the, the sigma, the variance for segregation within a family. Um, putting it sort of more biologically, if you've had selfing going on for so long that now you only have you know, three loci segregating within a selfing line, then it's three loci. It's not a polygenic model anymore. Um, of course, if you go on and you say that selfing lines are so inbred that they can be treated as one genotype, then, of course, you can just do the, the whole thing but treating the unit as the, as the selfing clones. Um, so it becomes uh, actually then an almost asexual model. So uh, the answer is kind of... No, in that, and there's a mathematical result there, but in terms of, you know, when do you go from treating it as a, a sexual population with a bit of inbreeding, which is the framework we're thinking of, to something which is almost sort of asexual, that I'm not sure where, where one decides which way to go. But I meant to deal with the occasional, so two lines that are very mm. homozygous, mm -hmm. but they have an occasional use mm -hmm. at this occasional mm -hmm. outcross levels. Mm -hmm. To deal with the many size there, but we would use this Gaussian. Then we can use the Gaussian, yeah, absolutely. Yes, it, the, the problem arises from variance within the selfing lines, but if that's very low, maybe it doesn't matter what it is anyway. So, so maybe it's not a big issue. Yeah. Are there other questions? I had maybe a, a similar sort of question. I was, you know, I, I, I see that these results apply for haploid organisms, right? Um, so I was, it, well, diploids but the with result, dominance. What's that? Well, with dominance, you have to have diploids, right? Right, but so. you, but but this result has, This also applies for haploids, right. yes. And, yes. And, okay. and in a sense, I was wondering if you compared the results for a haploid versus diploid, you could maybe figure out qualitatively what's going on with these like four-way components of relatedness and how that affects the ability to mm. predict the dynamics because there is no dominance variance in the haploid model right but there is epistatic variance and then i yes. assume what's going on is all this linkage disequilibrium that's being generated as part of the inheritance right from uh -huh. so that's why it's just trying to I mean, I don't understand this stuff that well, but I was thinking about maybe that's mm -hmm. where the linkage disequilibrium comes into effect. And I also was wondering, there is no inbreeding depression in the haploid model, is no. there? So, no, by definition. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's why, mm -hmm. I mean, I was actually thinking by definition, there's no dominance yeah. variance in the haploid model, yeah. but there, but the parents can be related, or I don't know. So I, I'm just trying to think about this stuff maybe for the first time, but I just was mm -hmm. wondering if you had thought about comparing those two, the dynamics that you might see under those two models that might, yeah. as a form of subtraction, reveal the importance or lack of importance of some of these more complicating factors. I suppose by reaction, I was surprised when I sort of got into the quantitative genetic literature just how much more complicated dominance makes things. And it does seem, as Alison mentioned, it's about the scaling, that with epistasis, the scaling works such that um, you only need the pairwise relationships. Um, but dominance gives substantial, sort of, it, it gives more nonlinearity, if you like. Um, I mean, the best solution would be for all the diploids to go extinct, then we'd only have to worry about the conservation of the haploid organisms, which is much more tractable. We wouldn't have inbreeding depression. But actually, most organisms we care about are diploid. So, you know, in real, if you really want to engage with sort of people in conservation, then you're, they will ask you about inbreeding depression and how that affects establishment and so on. So, yeah. Do you have a comment on them? No, it, it, it's hard to compare because they are very. Mm. I think you can see that the things like the dominance variance actually do matter. I mean, dominance mm. variance matters even when you don't have inbreeding depression. Yes. So yes. you start 
seeing those effects. I think we can probably approximate some of those higher order things using ideas that mm. were in an old paper of ours on something else. But, mm. um, yeah, it's hard to compare the dip it's hard to compare because we've done rather different things with them. We did epistasis in a haploid case. I actually do eventually refuse to do some of these calculations. <laughs> and we've hit the limit. We are not going to do higher order dominance components or epistasis. Dominance in by dominance these, interactions. Or dominance by yes. dominance interactions. Yeah, I've had it. I'm, I'm going to retire from this project. So you're not doing tetraploids? No. Actually, yes. someone emailed yes. Nick and asked about tetraploids, and I, I felt, felt it was cruel of him not to point out the truth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, don't do tetraploids. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually sort of impressive that in the early days, the great founders of our field in the 20s and 30s, they were dealing with tetraploids, you know. No one nowadays has they the strength. They simulating to make sure the results were true. That's they? true, yes. <laughs> um, okay, so if there are no more questions, let's thank again the speakers.